We're almost there. It's just loading. Okay. Okay. We are now live on YouTube. Great. Okay. I will call this meeting to order the Natural Resource Committee meeting on September 8th. I better look at the date or I'll get that wrong too. <laughs> so we'll call the meeting to order. Um, the first item is the adoption. There's Sam. Is the adoption of the agenda. Um, is there anybody who wants to uh, move things around or anything? I've got a couple of things, but I'm just going to talk about them in communication. So, you know, anybody want to move something? Add something to the agenda. Okay, so we can start with the presentation, which was the community tree plotter inventory, which I'm really looking forward to this. <laughs> okay, well, fair enough. Well, I'm Kristen Ramstad. I um, manage the Urban and Community Forestry Assistance Program here at the Oregon Department of Forestry. And tonight, I will be showing you a, um, a free to cities, well, I should say, a, a tree mapping and inventory software that is free for cities to use, Oregon cities to use to, um, to inventory and map their trees. Now, um, just to um, get everybody on the same page, did Laura send out a link to a little video or anything to show just a little demo video to you guys at all? Wait, I don't remember one. Um, okay, well, see. I happen to have one right here, which I thought I would just show you. It's, it's the one that um, Planet Geo, the company that makes the software has on YouTube. I can, I think I can uh, share my screen and share the sound. And then um, it takes about four minutes. It gives you an overview. And then what we'll do is we can go on to the Oregon tree plotter inventory site and I can also add information from there. So um, let's see, can I share my screen? It looks like- You I should, I gave you authority. So Kristen, you should probably just be able to Click yeah. on the share screen section and then. It looks like I can now. There you go. Um, I've learned over the years that if I don't say share my sound, you won't be able to hear a thing. So, okay, with any luck, um, you can see it. Let me um, make it full screen. Is, there, is everybody seeing that? And then we will. So the tree plotter demo application, where you can explore the core functionality of tree plotter inventory. Can you hear that? You can access this application either from your desktop or take it outside on your mobile device and map a few trees. Whoops. Let's go over some of the basics. If on a tablet, these tools will look the same. But if on a phone, some of these tools will be in the menu in the upper right of your screen, like so. First, you can close and reopen this landing page by clicking this home button in the upper left corner. You can navigate to your location on the map by clicking on the find your location button or search for an address using the where to search box in the navigation toolbar located on the left side of your map view. To add a tree, click on the add button in the upper right corner. When the add button is highlighted in blue, you are in add mode. Click on the map to plot a tree and then fill out as much or as little info as you need. Commonly, in urban environments, we have similar trees in a row or next to each other. So after you add a tree, use the load last button in the details form to clone the previous tree. Fill in the rest of the tree details and close out of the details form. 
Now you have successfully mapped your first two trees. When you are in ad mode, you will plot trees every time you click on the map until you turn ad mode off by clicking the add button again. You will notice here when I click the add button again, the blue turns off and now I am out of ad mode. Let's go back to our home extent to view a complete sample data set to use TreePlotter's other tools for analysis and exporting. I'll do that by pressing the house icon in the navigation toolbar. Now you can visualize your data using the interactive legend to display by certain attributes and get broad stats on your inventory. One of the most powerful tools in TreePlotter is the advanced filter, which allows you to isolate specific data sets by using attributes like I am here when choosing all of the sugarberry trees in good condition with a DBH range of 12 to 18 inches. You can also use the tree map filter to filter trees at a specific location by simply drawing a polygon around the trees you are trying to isolate. Using the attribute filters and the map filter allows for you to query your trees in a specialized way to fit your specific workflow. Explore more tools in the hub, like the stat section, where our responsive charts and graphs react to your live filters. And map tools, like labeling and printing your map creating custom interactive maps using our drawing and measuring tools. You can share map scenarios to share a customized URL containing a specific map view of your application. By clicking on the data table icon in the upper left corner, you can view your data in tabular format. Export your data, manipulate your views of the table, zoom to, or delete certain records. Now, you are ready to add some trees in your neighborhood using the TreePlotter demo application. Check out our support site at support.treeplotter.com for more videos, articles, and information on the TreePlotter software suite. Contact our sales team for a personalized demo today. Okay, so I know that was extremely fast, but there is a lot in that video that shows just the types of things that tree plotter can do. Um, now, let me see if I can stop this playing and escape from here. Turn off. Okay, now I'm going to share my screen again. I can figure out where I am and let's see. So now what we'll see is the Oregon Tree Plotter landing page. And um, so what we'll do, so what I, I'm already logged in. So I'll go to the um, Salem. This is just like a demo site that I keep. This is, um, this is uh, the Oregon Department of Forestry. I'm actually sitting right here, right next, right next to this tree over here um, as I'm talking here. And so what I'd like to show you at this point is, um, is for example, let's see, there's, let's go to a tree and you will see that when you, when you go to a tree and you map it, or you, I mean, in this case, I'm pulling up a tree that's already mapped. But basically what happens is on your tablet or your phone, you will see a, um, an in, a, a data entry form like this one. And you can um, fill in as much or as little of this type of, of this information as you want. Um, it even has, I have to move my, my uh, computer here as things like little site challenges and, and little things that I have added um, 
you know, as I have tweaked this for Oregon, that um, seem to be helpful for a lot of the uses um, here. Um, so let's see. So when you then when you add a tree, you can go in and you can use the search um, and you can search by a scientific name or common name. And then the, the most um, common that you have um, been searching on in a given site will come up in this to make it easier to, to find them if, if necessary. That's great. Kristen, can you add a new species if it's not in their list? Yes. Um, what, what I would like you to do is just let me know the species that you want to add. And, um, and then I will be happy to do it for you. And the reason is, is because um, I've, I've just been uh, dealing with this actually. Um, some of the users were adding trees that were actually on the list, but which had um, different names or were listed slightly differently than what they expected. Um, so, um, so they would say, look for it by their um, scientific name. And they wouldn't realize that I had the same tree um, under the same common name, but um, it has a slight, it, it's, its uh, scientific name has actually changed. So for example, a Sephora japonica is now called a stiffnolobium. So, you know, that kind of thing. So I, I try to keep it um, squared away um, at, at headquarters, so to speak. Um, let's see. Um, but as there is, I should mention that there are actually 800 trees in this um, list. And the reason there are so many is because we have added a lot of cultivated varieties. And the reason is, is that I realize and understand that a lot of people won't be able to identify to cultivated varieties. And that once you have the tag lost, you may not know what cultivated varieties you once had. But um, if, you, if you do um, know, um, you can, um, you can um, put that into the database so that over time, the known cultivars will be tracked and it'll be a way for cities to understand which cultivars are doing well where, as well as potentially nurseries will be able to understand which trees might be doing well where. As you can see from this little um, um, part, you can actually indicate that you want this tree uh, added to the database. And the reason I put this in here is because I can search on this and uh, from the state level and, can, um, and see it, can see it. And it's also a way for you guys to keep track. And then for people who are not as um, certain about a, a tree's ID, you can also indicate that there. So again, it can be, it can be searched on, it can be tracked and, and people can go back to the trees. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here. Um, the whole idea behind this is that this software will allow cities to um, create tree inventories and, and map their trees. Um, but it will also be, you know, everything that they put into Tree Plotter will also be part of the state tree inventory. Um, and the idea is that over years, slowly, incrementally, um, we'll be able to have tree inventories from different cities, um, you know, and be able to, you know, track various things if there's, you know, for example, if there's thousand canker disease in Woodburn, you know, how, is it also found in Jervis or whatever, you know, that kind of thing. So that's, that's the, the kind of the big um, picture viewpoint. Um, what else? Um, let's see. So this has a lot of things that you can add into it. Um, and, um, and then I also have a user's guide that, you know, will kind of identify, you know, how you, how you think of condition classes, um, and things like that. Um, there are clearance conflicts, observations, other observations, and then anything that's not on this list, again, you can put it in the, in the box here. 
Um, if you have trees that are planted for various reasons, um, you have there, that there, you can put in um, stock types. And then you can also upload photos of the trees. But I, at this point, I'm asking cities to um, just to kind of be a little bit, um, you know, not, not to upload too many photos, maybe up to three per tree. I don't know yet if it's, if it's going to slow down the system or even how much it's needed. I mean, if you, if you're looking at a tree and you're seeing some, I don't know, some um, decline or, you know, a conch that you're not aware, you know, you don't know what it is. That's a good thing to take a picture of, but just a picture of the tree itself might be easily captured on, you know, Google streets or something like that. So, you know, you can kind of determine how you, how and when you want to use that. And then um, the next tab is there's a way to put in the management tree, the management needs for, for trees. And again, these can all be, um, these can all be um, searched on. And then um, a couple of other things is, is that we have a, uh, a module in here, which we're just getting comfortable, we're, we're just starting to use. I don't know if it's, if I can bring it up or not. Um, let's see. I don't think we've, we've, um, we've got it hooked up yet, so to speak. But eventually what we'll be able to do and what we're working on right now is um, you can actually do tree walks. And so if you had, for example, if you had some heritage trees in your city and you want to create a tree walk, you could do that and people could follow it on their, on their phones. Or if you wanted to, um, you know, show your city council a tree walk of high risk trees that they should be aware of, you might want to put that on a tree walk and just share it with them. So there's all sorts of ways that you could, um, you could use that tool. Um, the other thing that we have, the other module we have is an EAB um, cost calculator. Now this can be used with um, anticipating not just emerald ash borer, but all sorts of uh, invasive insect type scenarios. And it kind of gives you a way of saying, you know, we have this many trees of this size and this many trees of that size. and if we had to take them out, how much would it cost? If we had to treat them, how much would it cost? That kind of thing. So um, let's see. So that's, that's um, that kind of thing. Um, so, um, so that's just a very, very quick overview of what this tool is. And I imagine at this point, you probably have some thoughts and ideas or questions about how it could be used in Oregon City. Uh, Kristen, I had a question. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just curious if when you're making a new entry uh, into the database, if you could somehow flag it, um, uh, just say like, we're gonna be relying on a lot of uh, volunteers to do some IDing. And if they, mm -hmm. for instance, cannot ID the species or they can ID like a special condition, can they take some photos, flag it to be audited by others later? Um, yeah, in that, in the, in the um, part of the form that I showed you about, I'm not sure of this tree's ID. Um, um, that is one place they can do it. They can also do it in a comment box. Um, but do you know um, who your volunteers are going to be? Um, me, uh, personally, no, <laughs> as, as far as I know, we were planning on crowdsourcing this to whoever was enthusiastic in the community. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a wide array of people. So expertise varies. Okay, um, so I'm sure Samantha would, would have more to add to that though. Yeah, we really haven't gotten to the nuts and bolts. Um, this is kind of our, we, we want to do this, and this is a high priority for the city as well as for our committee. Um, and so we, we haven't really gotten to the nuts and bolts. This is like, the, we're looking at this, and I think this is really exciting because this looks very easy to use. 
um, and very versatile in terms mm -hmm. of what you can get out of it. Um, it's definitely what we need, but we haven't really discussed how we're going to find people to do the inventory. We want to do that. We figured we'd probably put some something out and maybe the newsletters are on the city website or emails and, you know, see people who are interested in helping. So. Okay. So, um, so Planet Geo does have a, a crowdsourcing module that it can include, but the city would need to have its own contract with Planet Geo to do that. Um, the way this is set up at this point is that it's not really a crowdsourcing um, uh, application in the sense that, um, you know, we're really hoping that the data are pretty consistent um, because this is a statewide database. Yeah. And so um, we, you know, if we have a lot of people on there saying, well, I think this is a pine tree or is it a fir tree or maybe it's a spruce tree, um, that's a little problematic. Um, so one of, you know, we have a couple of, of different models that are being used by communities in Oregon. One is in Grants Pass, they've actually trained local um, uh, master gardeners to work as a volunteer cadre to, to work with the city to get this done. And then the, they are supervised by, in that case, a city forester, but it could be you know, a volunteer coordinator in a given city. And um, that way, each person who enters data into the system, um, they can be tracked. And the problem with doing it to just to just let the public do it is that it's much harder to track who is entering the data. And then the issue also is um, it may end up um, being uh, a lot more time and energy, um, you know, uh, correcting the data that that the public has entered than it would be just if if a few people went out on you know a half a year of Sundays and did the the tree inventory kind of starting in the middle of town and just kind of working out radially but that's just my suggestion I don't I don't know um, if that would work for you um, another you know another way to do it is that the city simply um, you know hires some data collectors. Um, and there are, I might be able to provide some grant funding for that, but not a lot, but, you know, I might be able to help you with that. Um, and so that's another option. Um, anyway, other thoughts, other questions? I know we had talked about doing something where we would, there would be people trained, mm -hmm. you know, so that they would have a fairly decent knowledge of tree species and maybe how you judge condition. Um, and then, you know, it would, could be public, but there'd be somebody who knew what was going on, who would be out with the public while they were, you know, so they could be measuring DBHs or something. And the, the person who knew what the trees were could be maybe entering the data that they're getting while they're doing it. So, mm -hmm. and we hadn't come, I mean, we haven't really talked about the nuts and bolts, but I knew we threw that out at one point. And that seemed like a, a reasonable idea. I think that's what Portland did. I know Portland has a fairly decent tree inventory they've been working on for a number of years. And I know mm -hmm. that they would have people in charge and then those people would, you know, reach out to different communities and organize that people in each neighborhood could then come out on certain days and, and help with the, the tree counts. And so, and, and that seemed to work pretty well. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, I mean, the issue would be, um, you know, um, the time it might take to do that. I mean, I can certainly train the trainers, but I think for data quality, it would be better to have a few people, you know, and I'm talking a few, maybe 10 to, you know, 15 people involved with doing the inventory 
they each have their user login mm -hmm. and um and you know and they work with a coordinator or, or whomever um to do it um ultimately the whole idea behind this is that someone in the city is comfortable enough using the system that they're actually using it to create a management plan and to um, you know, put some um, ideas in place about what the, your current condition is and where you want to go with it. I know we're, we're talking, one of the things we're talking about this evening is, you know, we've been talking about this for several months is the street tree list and what should be on it and what shouldn't be on it. And, mm -hmm. and you know, one of the suggestions is to take maples off, at least retire them for a time period, put them aside mm -hmm. um, because we do have a lot of maples, but we actually realize that we have no idea what our tree inventory is. It's kind of like eyeballing, like, well, we got a lot of red oaks and we got a lot of maples of different sorts. And so, you know, it's, it's we really need this to be able to determine you know, for tree diversity, do we want to really stop planting maples for a few years? You know, if something comes through that eats maples, which there are things on the way that could devastate the entire canopy. Um, so. so so, there are ways to do um, sample inventories where street segments or parts of town are, um, are randomly generated. And then you can go along there and you know do you know sampling uh, or just you know the inventory of the streets in that area and from that sample you can you can um, get some ideas of of your your basic um, makeup of your of your urban forest. I would say just simply living in Western Oregon, everybody has too many maples, um, and um, and probably too many. Um, plums and too many pears, <laughs> any number of things. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's also an option of, of just doing, you know, a, a sample inventory and just, you know, creating some, some uh, conclusions from that. At least for the interim period, yeah. I mean, there are two people on this committee who are pretty good at tree identification because Mike and I are both forest ecologists. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm really good at native trees and I can tell you that's a maple or that's an oak, but I have no idea if it's not a native, I'm really uncertain as to what type it actually is. So uh -huh. <laughs> I don't know how good Mike is with non-natives. So, no, I use the key. <laughs> so and it takes time. Yeah. Yeah. Depending on the species that you're trying to work out on the time of the year, if you're unfamiliar with them. Yeah. Yeah. It isn't trivial just to quickly inventory, but you know, you could start with, really basic classifications if you're training, you know, road beginners with, you know, deciduous versus evergreen work and work, work right. up the tree from there, you know? And so um, yeah. at some point, I mean, I, I've been going through their website while you've been giving this presentation. It's an amazing tool. Um, it actually has a tremendous number of variables that you can work with. Um, it, it's almost way too much for like a, a super generalized, you know, crowdsource type inventory process. Um, I would be like you have already expressed some concern. I'd be, I'd be concerned about um, data quality and how do you make that consistent if you have more than a half a dozen people involved in the inventory process. So um, yeah, so this is- Yeah, the, the other thing to keep in mind, and it's something that we, um, we, one of the reasons that we require that the city staff has buy-in to a, a project like this is because the trees are rated according to their condition and associated risk with those conditions. Mm -hmm. And so when data starts, you know, start coming in and the city realizes it has, you know, 20% of poor quality trees, then you know, they're going to want to try to get ahead of that rather than um, make the public aware of the fact that they have, you know, poor quality trees. They're going to want to create a plan on how to deal with the, with the trees, with the resources they have. So 
who sees the data, how much of that data is shared with the public again, is something that a city needs to consider for itself and can um, determine for itself how much of the, the, the collected data they want the public to see. Yeah. So, I mean, all this to say, um, I am more than happy to, um, to do a training. Um, uh, probably at this point, it's going to be you know mid to late October, which is a little late for identifying trees by their leaves. But there are a lot of ways to identify trees without their leaves on them, and um, and just getting used to using the the software um, on tablets and phones and things like that would be would be a way to go. Um, another thing is, is that, you know, you could start in a park and just ID the conifers in the park if you were working on it during the winter, you know, just, just to kind of get used to doing it that way. I like that it has an offline capability as well. It isn't just tied to having continuous uh, cloud connection for data entry, which is- Yes, it does. It, it does depend on how good your, your uh, like where your, um, your main computer is, what kind of connectivity you have like in your home or in your office or whatever. Um, I know in Grants Pass, they're not as connected as, you know, we've become used to up in the Willamette Valley North, you know, Northern part of the state, but, um, so they've had a little trouble with using it, but um, in Oregon City, it shouldn't be an issue. Yeah, no, we have good bandwidth. I think it's more about how the mobile app operates, um, how efficient that is. And mm -hmm. it looks like it's just a web interface rather than a standalone app. Is that is that the case? You're asking the wrong person, but I think so. There is actually on, um, on the Planet Geo, um, and their videos, if you look at YouTube Planet, Planet Geo videos, they yeah. actually do have a um, offline collector video that's about two minutes long. And uh, so that would, that would uh, do that. And actually, that's the kind of thing that um, one of the things that, that I do is that I meet with anybody and everybody who wants to talk about tree plotter who has questions. I meet um, on the fourth Tuesday of every month for TPI Tuesday and uh, at 2.30. And it's a Zoom call like this. And basically we come on and we talk about any of the issues that people are having. And if there is nobody you know, with issues or anything to talk about, I will come up with a, you know, a focal point like the offline collector or how to how to do reports or something like that. So um, it's just a way to get familiar with each other as a community, but also to answer, get your questions answered. This may be a little uh, advanced as well, the question I'm gonna ask, but um, are you aware of any other applications that can export into a format that this can import into? So for example, if you use like ArcGIS collector or you know some of the other true 100% mobile applications that are simpler to use, it can be programmed down to just like a few questions. Mm -hmm. um, can you import the, that data into this application you know, with someone okay. who could go through the data then? And, and so what, what we can do is we can import shape files Right. And we can import um, CSV files that have lat long information in them. Okay. And so the the trick is ideally, although we can there's a workaround, the trick is to have the fields um, named the same. Right. Because that just makes the crosswalk into it um, much easier. But it, it certainly can be done. And then I have seen um, ArcGIS maps that have used the tree plotter data. And so for example, in Grants Pass, um, they had some trees in a park 
and that was going to have some construction in it. The GIS tech in Grants Pass took the tree plotter data into ArcGIS and then drew what they felt would be critical root zones around the bases of those trees so that they could then plan the construction around where they thought the critical root zones might be for those trees. No, that's, that's cool. Well, we don't have an arborist in the city, but we definitely have a great GIS shop. So you know, they could, I'm sure, come up with an ArcGIS app for data entry that could be simplified. Um, so it sounds like you can do both directions. You could bring data into it. You could also export data into ArcGIS and use it in the city's own planning process. Yeah, as, as long as it's, as long as the, so for example, if you have um, condition codes in your ArcGIS app, they would have to be excellent, good, fair, poor, dead, or whatever, uh, instead of, you know, luscious, um, you know, declining, you know, so you, you want to have it so that they, that they match up. Right. Well, I just, you know, I've, I've built a few apps for, for our students. I was a professor uh, with the University of California and ran a field station. And so we oh, cool. did a lot of volunteer citizen science, as well as, you know, undergraduate, um, you know, inventory kinds of, of practices. And, um, one of our folks had developed basically a picture key for identifying phen phen phenological states of mm -hmm. native plants, which, you know, that approach would work well with tree seed, uh, with the tree inventory, urban tree inventories, because you could, you could use it not only to help identify the tree, but you could also look at diseases and you could look at, you know, conditions of the tree and you could look at you know, what's going on on the ground around the tree that mm -hmm. could be impacting the tree's health, you know, cool. and you, wow. you could make it more of a picture key, you know, that, you know, that just helps, you know, because it's hard on any kind of a graduated classification system, say, is it a fair or is it a good or is it a good or, you know, or excellent, you know, I mean, it's, it's kind of arbitrary. And yeah, it's, actually, um, <clears throat> it's, I might have to dig a little while to, to bring it up, but, um, and I'm gonna stop sharing right now, but um, actually the, um, the, the city forester in Grants Pass has created a user guide that has lots of little photos in it that help with that type of, um, of understanding of trees. And um, he has also included with the permission of um, the city of Portland, a tree ID list, a tree ID, um, well, I can't really, it's, it's not a list, but it's a way of doing a tree ID thing in there. That's really- For sure, yeah, yeah. that's so, good. Yeah. No, I think if we, depending on the direction that we go with this, if we go to a lot of volunteers, then we're gonna have to train them. There's gotta mm -hmm. be really basic, you know, tree 101 kind of training. Mm -hmm. Although, little. you know, I think, um, that the volunteer master gardeners that are doing it in Grants Pass are getting payback time for their volunteer time doing this. Mm -hmm. So there is an incentive for them to learn how to do it just because A, it's fun, but also um, they get to pay back their, their volunteer hours that way too. Sounds good. So um, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that next week, we are having an urban forestry, a virtual urban forestry conference in which one of the presenters is Ian Hanno, who is the founder and CEO of Planet Geo, who, in, who invented this, um, this software. So he will be um, demonstrating it at the conference as well and answering great, questions. Great to watch. Yeah. So I will... Um, Sam can send you that information <laughs> if she hasn't already. <laughs> so I've taken a lot of your time. It's six forty. Um, I'm happy to continue to answer questions, but I know you're here for a for a, an actual meeting for with other things. Sam, do you have things you want to ask or say? Um, you probably have more familiarity with doing tree inventories in cities. I mean, I had the students do one at Linfield years ago, 
um, and most of them didn't know it. They, they knew what tree was and they could do conifer versus not, but but I, I would just send them out and then I'd go out and ground truth it after them, you know, and, and I had a couple of students who knew botany fairly well. And so they were pretty good, you know, but there's one section because we actually got a free inventory software from some big company who's the, the, the daughter worked at, she's a student at Linfield and they, they saw the trees that went down. And so um, they actually offered to give us this huge software package for free and we jumped on it. And so uh, one of my students actually helped the facilities people this summer. And he went with our tree inventory and put them all into this in software package and, and said, it, it was pretty good until I got to this one section, the one section I hadn't had chance to ground truth because it was the very end of the semester. And he goes, it was just a nightmare. Oh. <laughs> they didn't know a maple from a dug fir. I'm like, oh, Lord, I didn't think they were that bad. But, but you know, so it, it worked pretty well you know, with minimal training and then with somebody going out and ground truthing it right after they did it. So, well, you know, if that could be exported in a CS, CV, CSV file with Latin longs, we can load it into the tree plotter if we can, if there's enough to crosswalk. Right, right. So, so um, yeah, it's definitely, Mike is right. It absolutely does take training. Um, and it would be ideal if we could get some you know, master gardener people or other uh, tree enthusiasts or plant enthusiast people involved um, to help with the identification. And I also am uh, connected with folks from the Portland Urban Forestry uh, Departments that have um, experienced training. Um, and also they, so the Portland Urban Forestry utilized a AmeriCorps hire to basically coordinate. Um, and that was beneficial for the person in that position. They could get valuable experience in the field. Um, and also it was affordable for the city to utilize that person in a seasonal capacity. Um, and they would have a, you know, a skill set that matched the need of that position. So it wouldn't just be all on the NRC necessarily, if the city was available or interested in utilizing an AmeriCorps, if we could swing it. Um, but um, but yeah, so I know the people that did the trainings um, for Portland Urban Forestry, they're happy to share their uh, mm -hmm. education materials. Grants Pass has also shared their education materials that is highlighting this tool specifically mm -hmm. in their training. Um, and I can even uh, coordinate with Grants Pass Urban Forester to uh, have a conversation with us if that was of interest. Um, so there's a lot of you, there's a lot of experienced people I'm connected with and I'm happy to invite if that's of interest or we can send questions to them and they'll be happy to uh, send back information. So it's kind of up to us, like how do we want to strategize our urban forest inventory? Do we wanna just do it small, like kind of insular, or do we wanna set up more kind of community-wide um, groups, like smaller groups that we would train and then launch into the community? And they would over time gradually, like neighborhood or blocks by blocks, collect the information over time. So for Portland, it took them over five years and they had a good contingent of volunteers, but it's, you know, many more trees. <laughs> um, so it's kind of up to us how we want to do it. How much of an investment do we want to do? And um, do we want an AmeriCorps person or other person to help facilitate? So definitely yeah, part of it is going to be a conversation with the city staff and how they also want to use the information as well and how, how they're going to, you know, one of the things you need to identify is who's going to maintain the database for the city with these, with these trees. You know, once you've collected it, who's actually going to be working with it? So... Yeah, that's right. So it's definitely going to be a partnership that the city is going to be 
utilizing this information. But so we need to make sure that whoever takes ownership and ultimately maintains it, this data set um, is going to be happy with the result and is going to be happy with like the ongoing maintenance and uh, mm -hmm. utilization of the data set. So lots to talk about. Yeah. And incidentally, I think um, I'm going to be meeting with both Ian Pano and the city forester from Grants Pass tomorrow to see if there's a way that Ian can bring um, part of the Grants Pass urban foresters experience with the with uh, tree plotter inventory into the conference to talk about it. So we'll see how that works. So, so. Yeah, we definitely need to to have a broader discussion with people in the city, you know, and since Laura's not here <laughs> to coordinate that right now, but you know, she's, she's just on vacation, so she'll be back. Yeah. But yeah, when she gets back, I think we definitely need to reach out and talk to have a broader discussion with mm -hmm. the people who are going to actually be using this and include them in all these discussions about what they want and what kind of data they want and what would be the most beneficial for them. Yeah, and ultimately to keep it in mind that any efforts you put towards doing a tree inventory involving volunteers, that can all be reported as, um, as growth award points. As a tree city, you can get you know, extra recognition for your, for your efforts to do tree inventories and creating uh, urban forestry management plans. Cool. Great. That would be good. Great. Well, I'm always here. If you ever have any other questions, I can certainly come back. Can you get your email? I'm sure Sam probably has your email, but uh, can you give it to Christina and maybe she could send it out to everybody in the committee so we would have that if we came up with more questions? Yeah, uh, in uh, fact. Yeah, Kristen, um, I'm C. Robertson at orcity.org. If you want to just email your contact information, I can forward it on. Yeah, do I? Um, I guess I can't do a question answer chat thing here. Okay. For some reason. Oh, I guess it might be because I'm we're live. <laughs> yeah, and we don't we, yeah, we don't have the question okay. chat on this format. But yeah, if you want to send me an email at C Robertson, R-O-V-E-R-T-S-O-N. Okay. At orcity.org. I will forward it all your contact information, whatever you want to pass on to the NRC. Okay. Sounds good. Be great. Thank you. Thank okay. you for coming. This has really been, I'm really excited about this. I get excited about tree inventory. So, you know. <laughs> Good. Good. I look forward to working with you guys. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Kristen. Thank Bye, you, Sam. Kristen. Yep. Bye, Kristen. Have a good night. <laughs> Bye, Sam. Have a nice night. That was really exciting, actually. I think there's so much potential. Um, I think we need to have better discussions about nuts and bolts you know, how we're going to do this and get people from the city involved, the pertinent people from the city involved, um, maybe have them come to the next meeting and actually talk about nuts and bolts and how we can get this working. And, you know, the idea, I think the master gardener idea is a really good idea. Mm -hmm. I like the idea of maybe getting somebody from AmeriCorps who could like lead it in the summer, you know, be the, the, the main contact person. And, you know, I kind of like the, I know what she was saying about, you don't want too many people entering data, but I also like the idea of, of involving people in neighborhoods if they want to be involved, because there mm -hmm. are a lot of people in Oregon City who would love to do this. I mean, who was it who did the tree inventory? Um, I can't remember anybody's name. I'm too tired. But, you know, these two women, one of whom has moved away, but they lived in the McLaughlin neighborhood and they just went around the McLaughlin neighborhood and did a tree inventory one year, just all on their own. You know, they didn't measure the trees, but they were just looking at the big trees in people's yards and in the street and everything. And so it was, you know, there is a lot of interest in doing this. And I think it'd be fun to get people involved, even if it was very rudimentary. And so that there was somebody with them who did know the trees and could help you know, would be entering the data, not the actual general public. But I think it'd be really fun and beneficial for the city to get to allow people to get involved. Great. And uh, Nancy, I, it, 
what you described there in the lawful neighborhood, that sounds like a Francesca Anton jam. It um, was with Francesca and, yeah. and, 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 and she's gone, which is too bad. I was really disappointed yeah. when she moved. I'm like, no, don't move. <laughs> and then the other lady whose name I, and I just saw her, she walked by my house mm -hmm. last summer and, and then she dropped the tree inventory off a little while ago. And so I have to make a copy and get it back to <laughs> her, you know, but. <laughs> Um, and I'm going to scan it so I can send it out to people. But um, yeah, it, I, it was really cool what they did. Um, and so I know yeah. there's a lot of interest and I know there's other people besides those two who would be interested in doing that kind of stuff, you know, and there's Rivercrest and so yeah, I also, no, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to offer at this time that uh, data management aside, as far as getting like um, just some expert boots on the ground to maybe you know, lead these groups of people from the neighborhood or, or just do their own inventory efforts. I'm sure that I could pull in some people uh, from the landscape industry or mm. even from um, the University of Oregon Landscape Architecture Department. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, they have- Clackamas, CCC has a horticulture department and maybe, you know, some of their professors and maybe students would be really interested in getting involved in this too which might be great for those students to have a chance to do some boots on the ground kind of stuff. Mm. Yeah. I'm like I said, I know native trees, this. but you know, you give me a cultivar and I don't know, it's a maple tree. <laughs> so, well, you know, the landscape folks, that. sorry. No, go, go ahead. ahead. I was going to say that um, the landscape folks are definitely going to be more familiar with the horticultural varieties. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the Clackamas Community College also has an urban forestry kind of a program is not so dedicated, but they have a program there uh, with training. Um, so I think they would be an excellent resource to just kind of, you know, investigate and see if they're interested. And we can like even say like, hey, it would be great to include Clackamas Community College's trees mm -hmm. in this data set. And that would be kind of like, you know, a way to include them, engage them more than just like help Oregon City do it. Like, hey, we have to be partners. We can, you know, help you. You'll have a data set and Clackamas Community College can then use that data set to become a tree campus USA. So we could be not only facilitators for them to be included in, including their trees in the city data set, but also promoting Tree City USA um, in general. So it'd be kind of like a ambassador, if you will. So just trying to promote partnerships in that way. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have anything they want to add? Okay, so I'm just going to propose when Laura gets back, I'm going to propose that we put this on the agenda for next time to discuss more the, the nuts and bolts of doing a tree inventory um, and to get the appropriate people from the city to invite them to the meeting so we can, because they need to be part of this discussion. They really do. We can't decide this without them. So. When we got the inventory from that company at Linfield, um, the first thing I did was I reached out to the head of um, facilities who desperately needed it because he was mopping up all the trees that had gone down and had to be removed and had no way of keeping track of things. And he was so excited. So he and I actually went to the training session to see what they could do. And he was the person who I let him design what he wanted in that. And so he, he loves it. <laughs> so, you know, it's really beneficial for the people who actually have to manage the trees. What is the word on getting a city forester? Um, I know that, uh, wasn't it Pete who had sent a recommendation? Has there been any follow through on that? Does anybody know? Since Pete left, I have no idea. Christina, do you have any idea? I don't know. I think that's a great follow-up question to Laura Turway when she gets back. Yeah. I know everybody in our department would be really excited to have it, but um, yeah. we're not in charge of hiring people. So right. uh, yeah. Laura, I, can, <laughs> Laura, I think can provide you the update. Right. My understanding was the city set some money aside for that um, with the ice storm money, but I don't know if it was actually enough to hire somebody but, you know, when you're hearing that grants pass as an urban forester and we don't, it, you know, this is ridiculous. <laughs> I 
I'm sorry, but <laughs> we definitely need one and we've needed one for quite a few years. So I think the ice storm kind of cemented the fact that how much we need somebody who is an expert in trees. So I totally agree. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Preaching to the choir. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. So I put on the city forester and to get people from the city um, to, to have a discussion at the next meeting. So I will I think, sorry, Nancy, I think it'd be really helpful. Um, what you said about the end user, I think Laura's going to ask a little bit more of like, who, who explain more, you know, who we should get. So start thinking in your head, like what kind of prompts do you want to give her so she can think about who the right people are? Because I, if you ask me that question, I don't think I would know who the right people are. And so I, I, probably I have two people back. in mind and they okay. come to meetings. I just, I am so tired. I can't oh, yeah. really okay. come up with my own name. So I actually have at least two people in mind okay. and, and with those ideas, she might have some, some other ideas. Right. Um, yeah, Sam. Um, well, they might align with what you're thinking, Nancy. So one would definitely be the public works uh, director or people that are closely uh, working with making these decisions about the trees and how they go in and what right. trees go in and where and when they maintain them or and so on. So whomever that person is, either if it's um, you know the director or someone below him, whomever that closely touches those trees more right. often Right. Um, and then the other person would be the folks from GIS. Mm, I didn't even think of the GIS people, but um, because be they're going to be responsible for maintaining it. So just like Oregon City has their own infrastructure system. So they have a similar inventory system for maintaining streets and utilities and lights and gas, gas lines and so on. It's not dissimilar at all um, for trees. They have their own characteristics and their own requirements, but the attitude towards trees can be very much aligned with infrastructure. Um, so just like roads and sidewalks need to be maintained, so too trees. So um, you can kind of use that platform of infrastructure and uh, that attitude of how do you maintain them over time and come back to it, um, replacing it, all those sim questions that you would have for your regular infrastructure you can still have with trees. Uh -huh. So I would say definitely those two folks for sure. And then I would also want planning <laughs> involved. Right. Yeah. Um, so we were asked questions. The commission asked us about sites that are really small. <laughs> what trees fit really well in these like, you know, sites that are just the size of my desk? Well, probably a shrub. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So if you want a big tree, you got to plan for a big tree. Um, and that's what the inventory is ideal for is planning at the end of the day, not just maintenance, but planning. What do you want your city to look like? So I would want those three main people involved. And then, of course, any auxiliary like other neighborhood associations or, right. you know, other folks that, you know, would touch on this. It could even be um, the like business development bureau, all these people have some sort of interconnection with trees. But at, at the closest part of it, I would say would be public works, GIS and planning. Right, right. You know, and then ultimately we could reach out to the neighborhood associations and, and probably PRAC, you know, the parks. and Rec Of course, yeah, parks would definitely yeah. be interested, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah, because we'd be doing trees in parks as well as trees out of parks. So yeah, okay. Thank you. Those, those were, I didn't even think of the GIS person and that is a very important person to include. I'm sleep legged. So, um, so are we good? I will definitely put that on the agenda for next time. Um, and so the next thing on the agenda is public comment. I don't think there's anybody here from the public. So I think we can ignore public comment. There's nobody here. Okay. <laughs> so, so that's, we can move on. Um, and the, the thing on old business is the street tree update. Um, we were talking about that. We've been working on that for a long time. And thanks to Sam. Um, I glanced at some of the stuff you sent, but again, I've been <laughs> school starting just, I get just hammered the first couple of weeks. So, um, but I glanced at those things. I like the idea of the shrubs because, you know, 
we tend to think of street trees need to be trees and you can plant shrubs and that's very appropriate. Um, so, um, but yeah, let's go to the street tree. You wanna talk, you wanna take it over, Sam? Sure. Um, so um, you've gotten all the uh, updated street tree list from Christina. I saw last the other night and I was looking through it. And I also looked at the, um, that there was some updates and edits from Kristen Romstad, who you just met this evening. Um, she had really good out, um, comments and recommendations. I didn't see any new uh, tree removals. She was kind of pushing, a, pushing back against uh, some of the maples that I recommended be put on hiatus um, for specific species. So we can revisit those if we wanna discuss them more. Um, again, I was mostly wanting them on hiatus, not on absolute removal, but I'm um, happy to keep uh, that open or put them back on the list if there's um, a strong uh, desire to do so. So, um, But I did also read the commission report, which talked about the smallest size, which is two and a half feet. And to be honest, I looked at Portland, I looked at Ashland, I looked at Grants Pass. Nobody's talking about two and a half feet plant sites. So um, I did look at Davy, which is a urban forestry uh, consultant group that's regional. Um, they have a large office here in Portland area. And um, I know some people that were with them. I think they also I have a way to get a hold of somebody from there if there is a desire to talk to them more closely. Um, their recommendation for very small sites, those two and a half foot sites, is trying to is basically all the all the species we have on our list right now. There was one. Um, it's basically a shrub, which I hadn't really thought about. So they could be your lilacs. They could be those um, camellias. They could be rhododendrons, which are very drought tolerant and hardy, um, at least mine is. So um, they tend to not have as invasive roots, which is what a lot of people are complaining about with those sidewalk um, damage. So when you plant trees with, you know, that, first of all, if you plant a tree that's too big in a site, you're going to have problems with your sidewalk and with your street, but you're also going to it requires a lot of investigation into what the rootstock is that's going in that site, aside from the size of the tree. So there are varieties of trees that tend to have non-invasive roots, which is the technical term I just learned last night. So um, exploring those species and those uh, and asking those questions at the nursery when you're planting the tree. So I don't know where big sidewalk problems were that were in the news. So I'd have to like go visit the site and maybe I could identify some of the trees um, and see what the problem trees were. But the likelihood is that they were very robust roots planted in two small sites. So um, that's probably gonna be a good planning question um, somehow to require developers plant appropriately. I don't know how. It's a very complicated uh, process to plant the right tree in the right spot in any urban infrastructure site, let alone making a requirement, <laughs> making a policy. So um, I'm not that expert. We could find somebody, but um, yeah. So anyway, we have all the right species that we have recommended to us. We could put those maples back on that I'd recommend put on hiatus if we wanted to. Um, but I don't think we're missing anything. No one I've reached out to has said anything about what about this tree? What about that tree that you're missing? Ultimately, we should probably explore more shrub options for those really small sites. Yeah, I agree with the shrub options. And I realized after you posted that, I don't know why I didn't think about it before, but I have a neighbor probably about a block away and they don't, I don't think it's two and a half feet, but it's not much bigger than that. They have a very small planting strip right along 9th Street. And they basically put in shrubs. Some of them they've pruned to look like trees. 
but you know, they're, they're shrubs and, and they do very well. They do irrigate, but they have like a drip system that goes down the sidewalk. And so they don't use a lot of water. Um, I don't know how well, so I think some of them are fairly drought tolerant and I think others may not be, but you know, they've got a variety. So it's not even a, a whole line of the same thing. They've got two or three different species in there, which is kind of good. And I, I like witch hazel. I love witch hazel. So I think that would be a really nice thing to put in there, but I really think we should explore the shrub option more for those small places because they will do. The only problem is you have to make sure they're trimmed up enough so when you pull out, you can see, because there's a couple of places in the McLaughlin neighborhood where they've got shrubs and you can't see anything. Yeah, yeah that's the caveat I was just going to mention is they do need more pruning because they will start putting up a shoot right. um, as shrubs do. So um, they will do well on a small site probably need more maintenance, um, minor right. maintenance, but um, more than the five to 10 year cycle that more um, upright trees do. And maybe plant them not as close to the corner, you know, yes. further away from the corner. So you've got more room to see when you're pulling out. So, but yeah, but yeah, I like the idea of exploring the shrubs. I mean, we could go with the list we have now um, and say, we want to add some shrubs to it. And I don't know whether you know, we kind of have to wait for Laura to come back before we actually move on anyway. So maybe put this on the next meeting and, you know, as a final thing and add some shrub species to it. Um, I think that'd be a really good thing to do. So a lot of those are flowering and people like those. And so, you know, we probably get a lot of people who really like to put shrubs in there and never thought about it. So. I could try to put the a, a list together using precedents from work. At, at Greenworks, we do a lot of uh, streetscapes. Okay. And uh, yeah, just like you said, there, there are a lot of kind of finicky implications with it, specifically with sight triangles. Um, you know, you don't want to plant anything that has like a hedge-like habit, you know, anything that would get too dense. You know, I, I think you, you got it just right. Um, it's got to be something where you just have that visual clearance. So tree forms or, or more ideal. But yeah, I, I can try to get together, um, yeah, a list of everything that we've tried locally and come ready with some recommendations on that front. That'd be great, yeah. Yeah, I'll do that. Thank you very much, It'd be great. Mm -hmm. Okay, anybody else have anything to add to the street tree? So we're kind of shelving it. We're not getting rid of it. We're, we're gonna pull it back up next week with some shrubs added as, and then we'll have uh, Laura, who can weigh in a little bit better on her thoughts on that. Um, sound good? Okay, communications. I have something. So I had volunteered last time to look at the current nuisance plant list that Oregon City has and to compare it with the Clackamas County nuisance plant list. And I thought it was going to be easy just to look and compare and add the things that are really out in, in your face to our list. And I immediately started just checking. There's a whole bunch of stuff on Oregon City's list that is not on Clackamas County's list. There's a bunch of stuff on Clackamas County's list that isn't on Oregon City's list. Um, in some cases, it came down to, and this is where I finally just gave up. I was doing this the other day and I realized that so many plant names have changed. They've changed the genus and species in many cases even. Um, and I caught it when I was looking at Himalayan blackberry and you know Himalayan blackberries had like five or six different genuses or species attached to the same genus. Um, and I realized that because I went on Oregon Flora to see what the latest one was and that's what Clackamas County has. And we have the old, one of the old terms we have, I think we have, see, I can't even remember. I can't even come up with that. It's bifrons is what they're using now. And they are Armeniensis or something like that. I mean, they, they keep changing that. That name has changed at least five times since I've been doing botany. <laughs> this is not, I'm not that old. <laughs> um, and, and heterohelix now there's also, they've realized that it, it's not all English ivy. There's some other ivies in there. So there are things that we definitely need to change and on there. But I also realized that it would take me a long time to look up every plant that was on our list to see what the real name was and whether we should worry about it. So at some point I just got overwhelmed and, and so I'm kind of thinking about um, um, 
you know, just, I don't want to shelve it. I really do. Cause it doesn't have like Italian Arabs not on our list at all. And it needs to be on there. So are there things that need to be on there? The Irish Ivy, which is the other type of English Ivy, which is, it's not hetero helix, it's hetero something else. Um, and so I think we need to, to do something to update the list, but I was just kind of overwhelmed and I didn't know how much I really wanted to put in to do a major change to this. And I think Laura was just talking about minor things because that would just, that we wouldn't have to do a whole code change. We could just do a minor modification to the list. Um, so I'm going to wait for her to come back. I just decided I'm going to wait until she comes back and I can talk to her about how much we really need to do and some of the things like we need to get the right scientific name for something like Blackberry. But, um, but I just, I don't know how much I really, how much we want to invest in it at this point. Because if we're talking minor, we're not talking about major changes to that list, which is what it actually needs. But <laughs> it, yeah, it's just weird. Yeah, Sam. So it sounds like you might need some assistance and somebody who can help do that comparison and crosswalk. Does that, is that? That right? would be helpful. Um, a lot of the things are grasses and I'm like not a grass person. And so I'm not sure when I look at a grass name other than reed canary grass, <laughs> which I know is really bad. You know, I have no idea what grasses are particularly invasive and which ones aren't. Um, and they have different grasses than we have. We have, we have, there's a lot of overlap, but there's things we have that they don't have. And there's things they have that we don't have. And I don't know, you know, since I don't know the invasiveness of some of those, I was at first just looking at the priority species or the things that I see a lot moving into like forest park and stuff and adding those. Um, but I'm not sure if that's what I need to do. Cause a lot of their priority species are grasses and things that I don't, lots of knotweed. There are knotweed and uh, knapweed. There are multiple species. And again, I think that may be a species change name where, cause there's spotted nap, knapweed and there's this kind of knapweed and there's that kind of knapweed. And at some point it's like, maybe we should just say all the knapweeds because they all seem to be pretty bad. So, I mean, and I don't know, but I thought I'd wait for Laura to give some kind of feedback on how much we really need to do to that or should we just look and add a few and bag it for now? So. I have a question. Would anyone in the parks department have familiarity with invasive since they manage the parks? I'm curious if they have folks out there that say like, oh yeah, this one for sure, that one for sure. Would that be valuable? I think that would be very valuable. Um, and Laura might have a better understanding of who that person would be that you know, I could maybe go and meet with them and say, okay, this is our list. And this is the city, you know, the county's list. And we kind of like to get these a little bit more coordinated, but you know, the county, cause the updates are all the time. They update it all the time, have the more recent scientific names. And so I'm thinking some of ours just, I think some of the things that they have that we don't have may just be a matter of scientific name changes. Um, but it'd be good to talk to them more and get, and again, get those people involved and then to find out from Laura, just how much change do we really want to do? So, so I will reach out to Laura when she gets back and talk to her about the, the nuisance plants. <laughs> I just thought it was going to be easy. You know, I talked to Mike, he went back the other day and I was like, ah, it's, you know, it's not going to be bad. It's not that bad. I looked at that. And I'm like, Oh my God. <laughs> I realized I could spend like three weeks just looking up all these different names to see if it was the same thing. So luckily Oregon Flora, when it gives the new scientific name, it also lists all the old scientific names. So you can look things up by the old scientific name and it'll tell you what the newer name is. Um, but even that there, yeah, there's a lot of things on our list and a lot of things on their list. So probably a couple hundred plants when you add the two together that need to be looked up. And so. But yeah, I think I think talking to Laura when she gets back and then finding somebody in the city who maybe has better familiarity with what all these things are. So. Um, does anybody else have any communications? I think we're all half asleep. <laughs> I know I am. Um, so future agenda items, I mean, I've already got three on there. So, you know, the next agendas, I don't know if Laura has something big planned because we've just kind of 
filled it up, but um, we definitely need to, I think the, the uh, tree inventory is the first priority to get that done. And then the street tree list. And I don't think we have that much to talk about. I think we've got the street trees pretty well nailed down at this point. And we can have the discussion as to whether leave the maples in or take them out. I mean, I could go either way. <laughs> I'm, I'm ambivalent toward maples at this point, um, other than maybe the amber maple because it's so small that it fits in. It doesn't really look like a normal maple anyway. So, um, Do we have any heritage tree nominations coming up? I don't. I know that there are some in the works, but I don't know where they are in the process. Okay. Without Laura being here, I think we're kind of clueless. I have a neighbor I'm going to go talk to her about nominating her giant oak tree that's in her front yard. So I just never see her outside. Or when she does, I'm like on my way to somewhere. I've got to go to the doctor. And then I come back and she's gone. Oh my God. <laughs> but I'll catch her. But so I think those are our three agenda items. The main one is the the um, tree inventory and then the street trees with adding shrubs. I think adding the shrubs is a key that would be really good to add to that list for the smaller places. Um, and then I will talk to her about the, this nuisance plant list again and see just what we want to do with that. So I'll have a better idea. But. You know, they're doing all that work on 8th Street right now to, you know, tearing up the curbs and the gutters and the and that's where there's two foot planter strips. They're like so narrow. <laughs> yeah. And and they made the street is so wide. It's, it's like you get that you fire can trucks, but it's not wide when you go above my house and the fire trucks go up there just fine. Uh, you so. could land a small aircraft on that yeah. road if it yeah, wasn't for overhead wires. You could. Yeah. And you know, yeah, they dug the storm sewer out the other night. Luckily, Steve called me when I was on my way home and said, be really careful. There's a big pit behind your, where your car is yeah. parked in the driveway. I have to pull my car because I have a Tesla and I have to charge it. Um, and I get there and they cut around. And so like two feet all the way around it. it was oh, it's deep. this tall right behind oh, your and, car. But it, was, but it was this deep. It was like literally a foot and a half deep hole. If somebody had driven in that it would have destroyed their car. Somebody walked in that and people walk and ride bikes up and down the street. They don't care if it's closed. Nobody cares if it's closed. They just go up in anyway. So, but, but they didn't put anything around it. They just put the no parking thing on top of it. I know. And it's like, so I went out and I put all the stuff around and put hazard tape, but all I had was my son's painter. So all I had was wet paint tape, which I thought they got a kick out of the next morning. But then I'm leaving and the next morning and I realized that they did two down the middle of the street between 8th and JQ and they didn't do anything with those either. Like they're really lucky somebody didn't fall in that. That would have been a major lawsuit. I mean, really, I was just like, and I called the manager because I've got his phone number. And of course he wasn't there because it was seven or eight o'clock at night, but I'm just like, oh my word. And last night, they, I thought they were going to pave today because last night so it's 7.30, they stop at seven, right? We, we can't park on our street from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. and then we can park on it. But although not very many people are parking on it anyway, but the guy, the street sweeper, guy was going up and down the street starting at 7 30 at night he went until about nine going up and down the street sweeping and washing and sweeping and washing and i go oh maybe they're gonna pave no <laughs> they did some test they did some test pay down on the bottom but no i haven't. mean they asphalted right at the top where they had really ground it down so it I oh, yeah. but the, you know I, they're gonna pave it one of these days but i just yeah Hey, Nancy, I had a question. Yeah. We got um, the board report from the commission. They had a question, a couple questions on there. Um, do we want to look at that real quick and, and make sure we answered every question on there? We could do that because I didn't even see that. So I'm going to want to. One of them was the street tree list, which we're okay. working on. Okay. Um, and the other one was like, you know, also about the planting diagram that they had. Oh, oh, and that whole thing that they, we should, we had it on, it was on the agenda like three months ago. And we kind of talked a little bit, but we didn't specifically talk about that. But, you know, I'm not an expert on planting trees and tree roots and what you need. So, 
I'm not sure. I kind of looked at that and go, I don't think there's anybody on this committee that is qualified to make that kind of a call. You know, so I would like we've done, I would coordinate with Friends of Trees since we have a contract with them and they're they're pretty expert, I would say. Yeah. Um, and they've been dealing with all sizes of trees and all types of planting sites. Um, so I would recommend them specifically. I think it's a bigger question than that diagram itself can answer. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like there's like issues around making sure that that first primary root that comes out of the stalk of the, the trunk of the tree is at grade level and not buried. That's critically right. important. Right. Otherwise you're gonna have a dead tree and like, you know, sooner than necessary. Um, so it's kind of a technical question more so than that diagram alone could answer. Right. Um, and I think trees, when you're putting a tree in something like that, it's gotta have supplemental water. Oh yes. No other, yes. And I don't know how much they water those during, or if they have any of those, how, how often they water them. Yeah. I'm sorry, so, y'all. Are we talking about the tree well section detail? Yeah, I think I so. I recall taking a look at that a couple months ago when it came up. Yeah, yeah. I work with some people that have some very strong opinions about root barriers. <laughs> how they could be uh, more of a detriment in, in certain circumstances. And, you know, uh, you should just use them with, with care. Um, Anyways, I could take that exact drawing and and mark it up because we have our own standard details okay. um, that we awesome. issue all the time. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, okay. um, I'm I'm going to need it though. I I don't believe I I don't think I have it. <laughs> I will go digging. It's in that board report, so it's got a link. It's okay. got like a footnote, and then at the bottom of the page, there's a footnote, and they're all links. So you just click okay. on it and it will open it up. So if you can't find it, I can, or Nancy or whomever, I'm happy to do it, can send you the link. That's but, a okay, I'd have to go back through our old agendas until I found the picture and I can't remember specifically. It was like two, three months ago, I think. The yeah. tree planting details also on our street tree planting permit page as a PDF attached online. Okay, great. Okay. And if I can get some contact information or, or just, you know, point me in the right direction, it would be very helpful if I got the AutoCAD files as well. Mm. Okay. I could edit them directly. That'd be awesome. We don't have that, so that's a good more <laughs> question because I don't know who created it. Okay, yeah, I could follow up on that. Is it most likely with Public Works, do you think? They, they may have coordinated with it. Um, th this may be a larger answer because street trees is that big question, right? There's, there's a kind of, it's not held in one, any particular department. So I don't know who actually created that detail. And uh, Laura may know, or mm -hmm. um, maybe Josh Wheeler, assistant city uh, engineer may know as well. Okay, gotcha. And they are just looking for recommendations, right? At this point. Yeah, yeah I think yeah. they were like, does this look feasible? And I looked at it and go, I don't know anything about tree roots. I mean, I'm not in the ground with that kind of stuff. So I didn't feel at all qualified. But yeah, if you, you've got expertise in that, that's great. It'd be wonderful to get some feedback from, you know, somebody who actually deals with trees and holes. <laughs> yeah, sure. I'd be happy to do that. Right. right. Uh, were there any other items from that list? Was it just those two, Sam? You're I'm muted. sorry, you're muted. I'm mute, Sam. Um, that's my memory, um, but I don't want to uh, extend the meeting unnecessarily. So, but I just don't want to ignore anything coming from the commission. <laughs> Yeah, I, I can go through that too. I can go look at that and see if I see anything that we've missed and I can send an email out to everybody. But, you know, we know we're at in the street trees, so we could reply through the street trees that we pretty much have it cemented down other than we made the realization that we need to add some shrubs for the very small places. So we're going to have that list. And so we should, it should be ready by next month. 
Um, and then the tree holes, Chris is going to work on that. So but at least now we're working on things. So. Okay, anybody else have anything? Okay, so I'm going to call this meeting adjourned and I will see you all in a month.